So as of the time of this video going up, we are moments away from Halloween Horror Nights 32, from the fog filling up the streets, the gates opening, and the horrors within coming to the forefront. And there's a lot of things to be excited for when it comes to Halloween Horror Nights 32, whether it's the heavy hitter IPs like Chucky, Stranger Things, or The Last of Us, or the fact that we're getting our first new icon with Dr. Oddfellow in over six years. This year is taking big, big swings when it comes to the event's storytelling, especially when it comes to the originals. So before we enter through the gates of Universal Studios Florida and experience Halloween Horror Nights 32, I wanted to do a roundup of all the original lore, history, backstories for all of our original houses, as well as lightly touching on some of the scare zones. I won't be talking about IPs here because the lore found within those properties comes with watching those properties. That's going to be the best way to understand the stories going on in these haunted houses. And because we're talking about the singular stories found within these original houses, I'm going to kind of be jumping around from house to house, so it's not going to be really one big story until we get to the end and I talk about sort of the connective tissue between all these originals. Anyway, let's waste no more time and get into the lore behind HHN 32. Now before we move forward, I guess we must address the rather odd elephant in the room, and that is Dr. Oddfellow himself. Now I made a whole video going in depth of Dr. Oddfellow's story through his Twisted Origins Haunted House, as well as the five scare zones featured at the event, but I'm briefly going to talk about them here just to give some context, however I really suggest you go watch that video to get the full story. Essentially Dr. Oddfellow has been a character within HHN lore for over 20 years, being introduced alongside Jack at HHN 10 in 2000. Back then, we didn't know what Oddfellow looked like, we didn't really know what he was about, except that he was the boss of Jack the Clown, owning the carnival of thrills that Jack performed at. Meanwhile though, Oddfellow has his own quest, his own thing he's looking for, and that is immortality. And he's looking through this in all stages of his life. Whether that be exploring a jungle in the 1920s where he finds a jade skull that gives him supernatural powers, invading a San Francisco shipping yard and releasing all kinds of fiendish monsters in the 1940s, causing mayhem at a 1960s music festival involving some vampires in there, or travel to the realm of the Zodiac and twist and manipulate it to gain more power and secure that immortality. Living forever is what Dr. Oddfellow is all about, and that's what he promises you as you enter the gates of Halloween Horror Nights this year. However, like I said earlier, I want to talk more about the individual stories. We're going to move away from Oddfellow for now and begin with our first haunted house if we're going in the route of the map, and that is Blood Moon Dark Offerings. This house follows the Shiler family, who are moon worshippers in a colonial era village named Parish Town. Specifically, we're going to focus on Constance Shiler, the matriarch of the family, who is dubbed as a lunatic and kind of the outcast of the town. She would travel into the village and spew premonitions and proclamations about the power of the moon and the celestial. And the villagers just kind of ignored these claims and thought she was crazy. However, there was someone who was listening, a young boy named Elias. Elias, while he wasn't initially big on their beliefs, was very close friends with Abigail, Constance's daughter, and the two of them just kind of grew up together and were best friends. After a rough winter where many villagers died, including her husband, Constance was distraught, feeling unheard as she withered away in grief. Meanwhile, this was the time of the annual harvest, a celebration the villagers desperately needed due to the bleakness of their colony at this moment. And as Elias asked Abigail to join him at the celebration, friction surrounding Abigail's beliefs in the Celestial began to instill strange feelings in Elias, as his romantic feelings for Abigail came forward despite the disapproval of his more conservative parents. After a very intense confrontation with his parents where they basically tell him he can't court Abigail, Elias runs into the forest and calls to the Celestial for guidance. He's then shocked when it answers. The moon began to emit a crimson glow, and at the this moment the lunatics, the outcasts of Parish Town, enact the sacrifice needed to feed the spirit of the Celestial. Elias runs back to the village and he discovers that at the forefront of it all was Abigail Shiler. And with his parents facing death on the other end of a knife, Elias is faced with a choice. Will he choose the way of the woman he loves, follow these moon worshippers, or abide by the desires of his parents? And if you're familiar with these kind of stories, you're going to know what he's going to choose. And yes, he picks up the knife, joins the lunatics, and their worship of 
the Blood Moon. Moving from one detailed backstory to another, we arrive at Dueling Dragons Choose Thy Fate. Now, of course, this is based on the defunct Islands of Adventure roller coaster that existed in the Lost Continent area of the park. This coaster was essentially based on a kingdom left in ruins after being destroyed by two dragons, Pyrock and Blizzrock, of fire and ice. However, the story isn't the exact same one as the one found in the attraction. With the story found in the haunted house, we begin with three kingdoms and three powerful sorcerers. On one side, we have the land of Hellfrost, who's home to the ice warlock Blizzrock. On another side, we have the Cinderlands, who's home to the fire warlock Pyrock. And finally, we have a peaceful meadow belonging to the sorcerer Merlin, who's looking to defend his kingdom from any danger, especially that from the other two kingdoms. As he's meditating in the quiet forest one day, out of nowhere, a figure appears out of the surrounding lake, forcefully drawing him in with her hypnotic appearance. Merlin wonders to himself, how could this be if he knows everyone within his kingdom? What kind of magic is this? This mysterious lady of the lake seems enticing to Merlin, but as he questions the source of this magic, he's unaware of the danger he's in right now, as she starts to manipulate and drain him of his power. It's not until he's being physically affected that he realizes what little power he has left. In a move of true sacrifice, he channels the last little bit of magic he has left into his magical spellbook, which was featured prominently in the original attraction's queue and is the key to ruling his kingdom. Doing this leaves him vulnerable, and he's morphed into an enchanted oak tree by this mysterious figure in an excruciating transformation. Not even the fury of Poseidon can save him from this spell. However, she's not not the only thing to worry about, as this attack alerts both Blizzrock and Pyrock, and with both of their armies, they begin their march towards Merlin's castle to retrieve the spellbook. Who will win? Well, that's for you to find out within this house. While they bring together characters like Merlin, Blizzrock, and Pyrock, as you can see, this isn't the exact same story that was featured in the Islands of Adventure roller coaster. And I think it does a good job in bringing new elements while mixing the ones we already know and love. Moving just next door, we have another original house, Yeti Campground Kills. And admittedly, there wasn't much backstory revealed for this house, so I'm not going to have a whole lot to talk about here. This is essentially a sequel to the Yeti Terror of the Yukon house from HHN 29, in which Yetis attacked a Yukon camp. Well, now they've moved from the Yukon to the Rocky Mountains and are attacking another campsite. However, this time you have a goal, to reach the Ranger Tower before it's too late. Like I said, we don't really know much about this house, but I don't think this one's going to be as story-driven as the past two we talked about, so not having a whole lot of backstory doesn't really make much of a difference. But something that has gotten some additional backstory is one of our scare zones, the scare zone in New York titled Vamp 69 Summer of Blood. Now, with this being the third entry in the Vamp Scare Zone series, with the original being Vamp 55 in 2016 and the sequel being Vamp 85 in 2018. This story adds to the growing lore of these Vamp series while tying in a little bit of Oddfellow's backstory that I didn't talk about in that Oddfellow video. Essentially, Vamp 69 follows a 15-year-old girl in 1969 who is obsessed with a fictional band named Cat and the Gemstones. And once she gets the opportunity to see them live in concert, she takes it and heads to Music Fest 69 with some of her best friends, Sherry and Paul. Once there, the atmosphere is electric. Tons of people gathered together for the love of the music and good vibes all around. It seemed as if nothing could go wrong. However, just as Cat and the Gemstones would take the stage, the sky went dark. Something sinister was on its way. At this moment, vampires are set loose and are feeding on the crowd, causing chaos every which way. After trying to find a way out and watching Sherry and Paul die right in front of her in a very gruesome fashion, she finds herself inside of a parked school bus, taking cover to survive the attack. It seems like she's drowning in the sounds of screams and carnage until it just stops. Confused, she looks out the window to see a single figure, someone she can't quite pick out, but looks like a survivor of the attack. As she gets out of the bus and tries to go towards him, she realizes he is not exactly as he seems. The man transforms before her very eyes, pulling a very particular cane out of his jacket and whistling down the street. She doesn't know it, but the man she just witnessed is one Dr. Rich Oddfellow. Finally, we move to our last original house, The Darkest Deal. 
We open with a conversation between two men, a bartender and a blues musician named Pine Straw Spruce. Pine Straw loves to play the blues, and the Mississippi Delta is a place where you can make it as a blues musician. However, he's just not been able to get the gigs and the fame he so desires. As he's expressing his impatience to the bartender, he turns around and tells Pine Straw a story of a man he knew who was in the exact same position as he was. He tells Pine Straw the story of a man named Roberto Fuentes, otherwise known as El Brujo. Roberto wanted to come to America and play the blues and infuse his Cuban musical style with that found in the States. He was hungry, he was looking for a break just like Pine Straw was. He kept striking out until one day he had it. He had the fire, he had the energy, and he had the attention of everyone in the Mississippi Delta. However, this took a toll on him not too long after, as he was paranoid, thinking he was seeing things and feeling like he was being hunted down. It wasn't too long after that that Roberto Fuentes was found dead. It's said that what gave Roberto his fire was something otherworldly. However, as the bartender is trying to warn Pine Straw of this, he doesn't really understand the message. He just wants the fame and the bright lights, and what he doesn't know is that that is exactly what's going to be coming to him mere moments after this interaction. After encountering a spooky hallucination of El Brujo's corpse in the bathroom, tension is high for Pine Straw as he's leaving the bar. And it wouldn't help that he would encounter a strange man just outside, wearing a pinstripe suit and wielding a cane. This man would offer Pine Straw exactly what he wanted, the fame he so desired, proposing an offer he couldn't refuse if he were to only meet him at the train tracks. And Pine Straw, on the high of hearing the story of El Brujo looking for his big break, has found it, and he agrees to meet this man again, possibly for the final time. Now we've talked about all of these backstories, what do they all have in common? Well there's the one theory that Oddfellow is actually appearing in all the haunted houses this year, at least all the original haunted houses, not just his own. I mean we're seeing him do it throughout the scare zones, and within the darkest deal the collector is said to wield a cane, of course that's the signature item of Dr. Oddfellow. And considering the fact that we're manipulating with time and immortality, we could be seeing time travel being used, as Oddfellow's kind of popping in these different time periods which are all pretty clear, so there could be a more physical connection with Oddfellow being in all these houses, but something that I've noticed that ties all these houses together are choices. In Blood Moon, Elias has to choose between his family or Abigail, following the lunatics or becoming a victim of them. In Dueling Dragons, you literally have to choose your fate, choose fire or ice, it's a big part of the attraction story and the haunted houses story. And in The Darkest Deal, we see Pine Straw Spruce have to make that choice, whether he's going to follow the collector to the train tracks, or is he going to step back and try to find fame another way. And even with Oddfellow himself, you see him offer you a choice of immortality if you choose to follow his path. While choices are important to any great story, it feels like they are at the center point of all of these different stories, almost kind of reminding me of the way Lady Luck was handled back at HHN 21. What will the true connection be? Only time will tell. I mean literally, I'm in Stay and Scream as this video is coming out, getting ready to experience some of these haunted houses, so you might see an update on this video once the event's over with the complete lore as filled in by the haunted houses themselves. But until then, I want to thank you all for watching this video. I just wanted to put out one more little video before Halloween Horror Nights officially kicks off. It's been a great time tracking the event, updates and vlogs and construction and stuff, and now it's here. Now it's time to experience everything that Dr. Oddfellow has to offer. And if you want to see my view on everything coming to HHN 32 this year, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. We have a lot more videos coming. But anyways, once again, I want to thank you all for watching this video. Thank you for rocking with me throughout this entire HHN 32 prep season, and I will of course see you in the next one. See you in the fog. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.